Well, we want to take just a few minutes to talk about the portions of Scripture that we've read. Isn't this uh, story of Joseph just something? I mean, it's, it's hard to not kind of feel the, the emotion when Joseph first sees his father. And the Hebrew says very clearly, he, he fell upon his neck. That's a good way of saying hugged each other. And then he cried on his neck, it says, for a long time. Isn't it amazing that families oftentimes are dysfunctional? I'm always, uh, I always consider the fact that, especially when I have, uh, have the privilege, the, the uh, blessed task, I guess you should say, of officiating at a funeral... And I talk with the families before, and they say, well, my uncle's coming, or my aunt's coming, or my mom and dad are coming, or my stepdad is coming, or, and we haven't talked for years. And then sometimes they ask, how should I handle that? Why is it the only time that we get together is at funerals? When we're estranged from our family, it seems like the last thing that happens is we come together over someone that we have equal appreciation for. Well, God wants us to be able to make ways, if possible, to love each other and to express our love for each other. It doesn't mean that we disregard the, the wrongs that have gone on. But it means that somehow we, we find ways to talk about them and to reconcile if possible. I just It's hard for me to put my feet in the shoes of Joseph or sandals. What would it have been like not to see your father and, and have every reason to believe that he thinks you're dead? He certainly could have, if he had wanted to, contact him, Right? Now he's uh, in the government of Egypt. He could have sent a servant at any time he wanted. Say, go over to Canaan and find this group of people and tell them Joseph's alive. He didn't do that. Why? Maybe for fear fear that what might have happened to Benjamin or what kind of revenge his his brothers might have taken uh, in general. Or maybe... He didn't think his father would believe a messenger? I don't know. But in the providence of God, and isn't that what this whole story is reminding us about time and time and time again? Joseph says again, God brought me up here. God brought me here. We're going to have that great uh, uh, phrase that we have at the end of the story. You meant it to me for evil. But God meant it to me for good. If only we in our faith would have strong enough faith to look at those things in our life that come upon us, not because we have acted foolishly or we have sinned, but those things that have happened to us because we don't know why. Joseph couldn't probably have figured out why his brothers hated him so much. Had he done anything to be hated? Doesn't seem as though he did. But all the way through this story, what do we see with Joseph? His heart remains soft. What does bitterness do? It makes a hard heart. You know the problem with a hard heart? It doesn't work very well. Hardening of the arteries is one thing. Hardening of the heart is quite another Let us not allow the things of life, the disappointments of life, the fear of the future, or whatever it may be, to harden our hearts towards others. We need to keep a soft heart. And we see that with Joseph. He doesn't take it out on his brothers when he certainly could have. He could have had them done away with. He could have had them put to hard, hard labor. 
imprisoned. He could have humiliated them. Humiliations galore. But he didn't. Did he know what the verse would say later on? <laughs> Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Well, in the first verse of our story, this inspired story, it says that Judah leads the way. Last night around uh, Arab Shabbat, we were talking about, the question came up, someone asked, had asked someone who came to our table, had asked him, what is the law anyway? We have an excellent example of it in the, one of the words in the first verse here of our chapter. It says, and, and he asked Judah to lead the way to Goshen. The word lead is ira. It's the word we get Torah from. Torah is from this verb, which means to go from one place to another or to hit the target or to go to the destination to, to lead the way. That's what Torah is. We always think of law as what I can't do. No, Torah is God's instruction in righteousness. And we usually translate Torah as law, right? In your English Bibles, the law of Moses, when it's Torah, it should better be translated the teaching of Moses or the instruction. What was Judah doing as he led the way? He was saying, come on, go this way. No, no, don't go that way. Go this way. We need to turn this way now so that we get to Goshen. That's what the Torah does. The Torah leads us in the path of righteousness. I dare say that the people who believe that the Torah has been abolished would never be willing to say, if they're truly believers in God, that God's instruction has been abolished. abolished. Or that Yeshua, Jesus, did away with God's instructions. <laughs> they wouldn't say, no, 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 I don't believe that. Well, when you say the Torah has been abolished, you're just saying that God's instructions have been done away with. And he didn't know what he was doing in the first place. Right. You see, we have a negative view of law oftentimes. Law is the stuff that gets you in trouble. Right? Law is the stuff that you have to do even when you don't want to. You know, you're in a hurry, and the person ahead of you is going 20 miles underneath the speed limit. You got the double line, so you can't pass, but you say, nobody's looking, I'll pass anyway. Say, no, I can't do that, I'll get a ticket. Then I'll have to pay money. I guess, oh, I really wish I could pass this guy. You know, you're honking at him, he doesn't care. And you're in a hurry. We think of the law as something that keeps us from doing what we want to do. That's not what the Torah is. The Torah helps us to do what God wants us to do. Isn't it a privilege to be able to know God and to walk in His ways? This is why we say a blessing when we put a tallit on, when we, put a, when we put our tzitzit on in the morning. We say a blessing, say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for letting me have this symbol upon me. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be going my own way. I'd be going off doing what I want to do rather than what you want to do. That what you want me to do. Well, having heard that his father had arrived there, Joseph's, Joseph chariots his way to meet him. You see, they were coming in wagons. What are those? Volkswagens? And he was coming in a chariot. What's that? Jaguar? BMW? Mercedes? I don't know. He was coming in style. The scene of reunion is given in short yet emotional tones in our text. As soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. The text is ambiguous. Who did the weeping? Did Jacob weep on Joseph's neck or did Joseph weep on Jacob's? Well, you say, why do you even ask that? Isn't that I, I, I think it's interesting because it shows you that the rabbis, how they like to make up crazy stories to, to, for, just for the fun of it. I, they did I don't know. They didn't have crossword puzzles. They just did it with the Torah. Um, the majority of the sages take it that Joseph is the one who wept for joy at the sight of his father, suggesting that Jacob was busy reciting the Shema at that time and did not want to interrupt his prayers. 
Oh, I don't think so. He didn't go to the synagogue. He met him somewhere out in the desert. Maimonides, or Nachmanides, excuse me, Rambon, takes it to be the Jacob who fell upon Joseph's neck and wept. And he says, it's well known whose tears are more present, the aged parent who finds his long lost son alive after being despaired and mourn for him, or the young son who rules. Well, I will have to admit this, and I'm not happy to admit it, but it's a reality. As I've gotten older, I cry eat more easily. Now, some of the rest of you, what is that? You know, I'm thinking, no, I'm not going to tear up. No, I'm not going to cry. You know, and I start thinking about rust. Okay, that's, you, you know, you can think about rust. Oxidation. What causes oxidation? Oh, yes, I remember the molecules do this. You know, you start thinking about something else so that you're not being focusing upon the emotion so you won't cry. It's just not manly to cry, right? Women cry. Men just, we just keep a stiff upper lip. Not a real man? Who said that? Oh. Well, I think the older we get, the more we recognize how much we're grateful for. You know, it's just, and I'm not putting down young people at all. It's just that when you're young, you just think, come on, I've got so much life ahead of me. I've got so, you know, I got strength. I've got health. I'm, man, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, and as you get older and older, you start thinking, you know, I can count the number of years if I live as long as my mother or my father did. I've got this many years left. You don't think that way when you're 18. Things become more precious to you. And so, well, I think the reality is that the love of the father for his son is clearly expressed, and equally so is the son's love for his father. Exactly what our text wants us to see, I'm not sure, except for this, that they both were extremely happy to see each other, right? Don't you think sometimes it might be the Holy Spirit that produces those tears, and as you get older, hopefully you get closer to him? Well, I certainly hope that's the case, and I long for that to be the case. I think we all do. It's a good point. Jacob knew that the godless culture of the Egyptians was no place for his family to raise children and live. He further knew that as shepherds they would be despised by the Egyptians who considered the task of herdsmen one for slaves or the lower stratum of society. Who kept care of the herds in Egypt? As far as we can tell, even from Egyptian chronicles, it were those who were poor and had to enslave themselves or it was foreigners that they conquered and brought them in to be their slaves. They did not like shoveling manure. They thought that was well below any true Egyptian citizen. And they were the most powerful nation at the time, so they had plenty of slaves to do that kind of work. So Joseph instructs his brothers to make known their livelihood to Pharaoh, reasoning that as a result they would be offered a place to live that was isolated from the mainstream of Egyptian society, that is, from the cities. The animal-worshipping Egyptians loathed herdsmen as far too earthy for their lofty ideals. This points out an interesting distinction between the Egyptians and Jacob's clan. As shepherds, Jacob and his sons had learned kindness and generosity as they cared for dependent animals. You know, and some of you are very, very close to your pets and your animals that you have, and you've learned how to care for them in a way that maybe other people wouldn't because you see their needs. Well... Jacob and his clan further had learned to depend upon God for their very occupation required his blessing of rain upon the fields in order to give grazing land for the flocks, right? When we were in Ohio for a week, just a few weeks ago, it's amazing to go back to an, uh, a, an agricultural society. And this little town that the university is in that uh, where my wife and I met each other at, in Cedarville, Ohio, it's all, it's all rural. I mean... This little teeny city, you go any direction out of the city and all you see is cornfields and, and uh, soybeans and wheat and so forth and so on. And everybody you meet is a farmer. You know, when you're at the cafe, you know, when you're getting ice cream, everybody there is, you know, they're, they're making their living out in the fields and, uh, and uh, milking cows and dairy and so forth and so on. That's just the, the part of it. And it's a different society, isn't it? If you've grown up in the city all of your life and you've never been out in the, in the rural, when you go out in the rural, it's like you're in a different culture. What is that? Well, there's a sense in which 
I think in, a, in an agrarian culture, mankind recognizes his weaknesses because he says, there's nothing I can do. If it doesn't rain, we're, we're, we're lost. We're, we're in trouble if it doesn't rain. Or if it rains too much at the wrong time, right? All the wheat lays down on the field, now you can't harvest it. You're constantly looking at the sky. You're constantly looking to see what's next and so forth and so on. And then you see life come and go. You see the cycle of life on a regular basis. It's a different perspective. Israel was an agrarian society. Now, I have to be careful here because I'll get in trouble. But let me ask you this question just to make my point. Let's say, for instance, you were a leather worker. You made things out of leather. You had a nice little shop somewhere close to the city so that you could sell the things that you made out of leather. And you made, and I'm talking in first century here, I'm talking in the time of Yeshua, okay? And you tooled your belts and your other implements and so forth out of leather, and you were selling them. You got, so you got money in. Were you supposed to tithe that money? Is there anywhere in the Torah that it says you have to tithe your money? No. All of the tithes, all of the first fruits come from the ground. You tithe the wheat. You tithe the harvest. You tithe the, the produce. You tithe the flocks, the first of the flocks, the first of the herd. Go read it. So the question is, so none of us have to give tithes here. None of you can give tithes. It's impossible. Because where are you supposed to give your tithe? To whom? To the priest. This is why in the early emerging church, the clergymen called themselves priests. One of the reasons. You can go read it in the church fathers. Do not forget to give your tithe to the priest. Mm -mm. The priest is the from the tribe of Levi, the family of Aaron, who were serving at the temple in Jerusalem. Don't get me on this. I've been thinking about this for a long time. Someone asked me yesterday by way of an email. It says in the Bible when Solomon made the temple, he said, and for those, of, you, for those of who pray toward this place, you will hear their prayers. So does that mean we always have to pray facing Jerusalem? What happens if you're driving your car to uh, Seattle? You can't pray? No, of course not. What's the point? Why is Jerusalem the focus? Because it's, going to, it's the focus because of who's going to be there reigning. To keep our minds, our hearts, and our direction upon the fact that it doesn't end in Seattle. It doesn't end in Brooklyn. It doesn't end anywhere but in Jerusalem. There's something about God's promise and plan that centers in a city where he put his name, where he put his ears, his eyes, and his heart forever. Right? So tithing is... Now, is it okay to practice? Of course it's okay to practice. And there's always offerings. What are we supposed to do with offerings? Give as much as you want to. Be a cheerful giver. Be happy about it. Honor God with the substance that you have. All right? But I just say, look, there's something about the land that God keeps bringing us back to. And it's not the United States of America. It's a piece of land in the Near East that is called Israel. And the borders are going to be expanded in the future, believe me. I just wanted to echo what you were saying about uh, living in, basically in the country. I heard a teaching, and ever since then, it's just been like this no-duh type thing. Where I've always wondered, uh, why are there so many atheists or people who have absolutely no faith in inner city areas? And then out in the country, almost everyone believes in God, no matter how rough around the edges they are. Yeah. They have, they're like, well, of course there's a God. Um, I heard somebody say, well, when you go to the city and you look around, how many things can you see there that were actually created by God and not <laughs> by man? You can't even see the stars at night, you know. In the city. Yeah, because there's too many lights in the city. Everything is made by man. So you go, where's God? You know, But when you go out in the country, you can't do anything without seeing what God has created. Right. And you can't do anything without dealing with what God has created. So it's just sort of obvious. That yeah, and my suggestion is, let's not all move out to the country. Okay. Right, right. But my suggestion is, if you have the opportunity, 
Plant something. You know, if you own your own house and you have a, a place where you can do gardening, you know, plant some flowers, plant things, have to get your hands in the dirt and, and you know, and you say, well, I live in an apartment. Well, do you have a balcony? Can you put some pots out there and put some flowers out there? And you have to water them. You have to take care of them, et cetera, et cetera. There's something about doing that that is good for us. Having lived in the city for a long time and then moving to a wheat ranch in eastern Washington, what struck me, first of all, besides all the things that we've said, is that I realized in the city you can be dishonest and reap huge profits year after year. And in the farm, you cannot be dishonest to the land for very long or it will <laughs> stop producing, and then yeah. you've had it. Good point, good point. Well, this is what we learned from, uh, one thing we learned from our text, is that as shepherds, Jacob and his sons had learned kindness and generosity as they cared for dependent animals. They further had learned to depend upon God for their very occupation, requiring his blessing of rain upon the fields in order to give grazing land for their flocks. In distinction, the Egyptian agricultural society thrived through slavery and disregard for human dignity. If you do study ancient Egyptian history, they were cruel, cruel people. What they did to their conquered slaves was unbelievable. They weren't quite as cruel as the Assyrians, but close to it. And this is why Israel was trying to decide, should we ask for Assyria's help or should we ask for Egypt, Egypt's help? You know, which one? Well, the result was a very perverse society. The Egyptian society was full of the occult. It rested upon the occult. The plan of Joseph to settle his family some distance from Egyptian culture worked perfectly, and Pharaoh gave him full authority to settle his family in the lush valleys of Goshen, perfect for raising flocks. He further offers to them the opportunity to pasture his own animals, which would bring financial blessing from the royal coffers. Eventually, Joseph brings his father to meet Pharaoh. Now, here's the question. Why did Jacob bless Pharaoh? <laughs> okay, he took care of his son Joseph. But Pharaoh was pagan as you can imagine. Can we bless those who are so contrary to what we know to be right? Okay, so it reminds us of what Paul says. He says, pray for those who have the rule over you, but for what reason? So that you may live a quiet and peaceable life. Right? Mike? Uh, well, we have the example in Scripture many times of the uh, lesser <laughs> blessing the greater, like we're told to bless God and um, Peter begins his epistles, you know, blessed be the God and you know, he blesses God at the beginning of what, first Peter? Oh yeah, sure. There and yeah. uh, <clears throat> you have that and uh, I don't know, maybe it was a sign of respect or something like it, that. It may well have been. It may well yeah, have been, sure. You notice that uh, Joseph, once he was there, he didn't start a political campaign to get rid of idolatry <laughs> in the land or uh, yeah. Yeah. you know have a big revival service or something or. yeah well it's an interesting kind of thing to contemplate of course remember we're in narrative here it's mm -hmm. telling us what happened not necessarily everything that should have happened but we can take lessons from it so Joseph brings his father to meet Pharaoh. The scene presents the reader with various questions. Obviously, with Joseph being second in command, it was only proper that he should bring his father to meet Pharaoh. Interestingly, the first question Pharaoh asks is, how long have you lived? Perhaps Pharaoh was curious as to whether Jacob had attained the ideal age from an Egyptian perspective, which was 110 years. You can read in the annals of the pharaohs, which have been translated... You can read, uh, Sarna brings this up in his uh, JPS Torah commentary, that 110 years was considered the prime proof that the gods had shined their, their blessings upon you in Egyptian culture if you lived to be 110 years. Now, I don't know if Jacob was aware of this or not, but if he was, what his answer is big time tongue in cheek. He says, or uh, I put here in the notes, a subtle jibe. The years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been these years of my life, 
nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourn. So, Pharaoh, you think 110 years is the best? Well, I've only lived 130, and that hasn't been all that great, not nearly what my fathers lived. In Jacob's point of view, 130 years are few, trumping the Egyptian 110 ideal. Abraham had lived 180 years and Isaac 175, and why not? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the God of life, while the Pharaoh and his people were religiously consumed with death. What do we remember about Egypt today? Pyramids. Isn't it just, when we get into Exodus, it's going to be, you know, what a mock when they, when they say, why did we leave Egypt? We could have died there. Are there not enough tombs in Egypt? Yeah, there's plenty of tombs in Egypt. They were big on death. Sometimes I wonder if this is creeping into our culture. I don't know what it is. I see bumper stickers with skull and crossbones and, you know, uh, it looks like skeletons. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I didn't want to bring that up. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. I mean, tattoos with skull and crossbones and, and death seems to be all part of it. Who's the father of death? Satan. One is also struck with the fact that Jacob blessed Pharaoh. What kind of blessing could the patriarch give this pagan ruler? Is it proper to ask the Almighty to bless the pagan Pharaoh? The answer is yes. God has shown throughout the history of Israel that he uses even pagan rulers to further his eternal plans. It says in Proverbs 21, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Can we put the word president there? The president's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. In the hand of the Lord, he turns it wherever he wishes. I sure believe that God can do all of his holy will, but it doesn't overturn the fact that the United States of America as a nation has turned our back upon God as a nation. And what comes, we can only say we deserve. So I don't want to get on the political thing here, but I don't think I've ever wrung my hands or my heart like I have in this season. It's like, I, it just, it, 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 it's just amazing. You just say to yourself, you know, I don't know, crook one, crook two, liar one, liar two, you know. Yeah, Cain and not Abel. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just, I just, there, we, used to, we used to at least have people that ran for office that said they stood for something. They stood for something other than just standing for nothing. I, I, I just, I fear what God may allow this country to go through. But I can guarantee you this, that if things get darker, he will enable us to have our lights shine more brightly. We may have a greater opportunity for the gospel in the next four years than we've ever had. If we stay firm and humble before the Lord and seek his help and his strength. The sages in the Midrash note that as a result of Jacob's blessing, the famine, which was to last five more years, was shortened and lasted only two more years. Whatever the nature, and I don't know if the chronology there is complete, perhaps we just come in at the last two years. Whatever the nature and outcome of Jacob's blessings, we may derive from his example that it is never wrong to seek God's blessing upon those who rule over us. We are reminded of Paul's admonition that prayer should be offered, quote, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. 1 Timothy 2.2. 2. It is proper to pray for the president, for the governor, for the senator, for the congressman. It's proper to pray that God would enable us to continue to meet freely and to spread forth the word of the gospel freely. Joseph continued to administrate the Egyptian allocation of food. As the famine grew more and more severe, the wealth of the Egyptian population was consumed in buying food. Eventually, they were compelled to give up flocks and land in order to buy provisions. Our text notes that in this way, Joseph acquired wealth, including land, for Pharaoh. Those who owned the land were relocated to cities throughout Egypt in order to facilitate the allocation of food. We are also told that Jacob and his family acquired land themselves in distinction from the Egyptians who had to give up land for, God, for food for God had blessed Jacob just as he had promised. Jacob lived 17 years in Egypt. He was 130 when he came and died at the age of 147. 
Our text contains the final request of Jacob as he nears the end of his life. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. Why is Jacob so intent upon being buried in the same place as his ancestral fathers were buried? The meaning is obvious. Jacob placed his hope on the promise of God, which included the promise of the land. Jacob still had the covenant promises of God well in mind. His having settled in the land of Egypt had not eclipsed the hope of a covenant fully realized in the future. Moreover, the desire to be buried with his forefathers also emphasizes Jacob's belief in the future resurrection. For him, burial was not merely a cultural thing, but it bespoke a hope in God's eternal faithfulness. It says that even when in Joseph's dream, right, his mother was going to bow before him. But she had died already. There's resurrection all through the Tanakh. Like Abraham, who had his servant Eleazar take an oath by placing his hand under the thigh, so Jacob requires Joseph to take a similar oath. What does this mean? It may seem very foreign to us, but this manner of oath-taking was no doubt tied to the sign of the covenant, that is, circumcision. Placing the hand under the thigh was an oath taken in the proximity of the covenant sign. Thus the oath that Joseph took would be the persuasive factor in gaining Pharaoh's approval to bury his father outside of the land. Our Pasha ends with Israel prostrating himself toward the head of his bed. Those of you who know have heard this before, but just say it again. The word for bed in the Hebrew is mitah. There's another word with exactly the same consonant, mate, which means staff or rod. So if you don't have the vowels, you don't know whether it says he leaned on his bed or he leaned on his staff. And apparently, when the Septuagint was translated, that is, the Old Testament translated into Greek, uh, maybe they didn't have the vowels, or maybe they didn't read them correctly. So when this is uh, quoted in the book of Hebrews, it says he was leaning on his staff rather than upon his bed. Okay, so which, which is right? Well, we don't know. Does it matter? Not really. But what, what is the point here? What happened to Jacob when he wrestled with that man? He hurt his hip big time. From then on, do you think he limped just a little bit? The proud chin up, Jacob, the deceiver. Now he's walking more humbly. And he's leaning, he's bowing upon his bed just before his death. There's a word, yashar, which means to be upright. It means to be honest and righteous. Many people think that the name Yesharun, which is another name for Israel, means upright. The one who is upright. How can someone limping be upright? It's his heart. God doesn't look on the outward appearance like man looks. God looks on the heart. So how can we stand upright before the Lord? Have a humble heart. Be bowed over before his greatness if you want to stand upright in his sight. Only those who recognize their own weaknesses and who willingly prostrate themselves before the Almighty attain the status of upright. To stand tall, we have to bow. The Hafra passage is linked through the obvious thematic as well as verbal similarities to our portion. It records the time of King David's death and his charge to his son Solomon, just as our Torah portion speaks of the death of Jacob, and his request that his remains be carried to the land. Likewise, in Genesis 47:29, the words are, When the time for Israel drew near to die, and the exact phrase is found in the opening line of the Hafra, as David's time to die drew near. Moreover, in the same manner that Israel had the promise of covenant well in mind, so David admonishes Solomon on the basis of covenant made with him that his house or his dynasty would remain as his sons walked in the Torah of Adonai. God's covenant with David was eternal, as we read in Psalm 89. My loving kindness I will keep for him, that is David, forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish a descendant forever and his throne on the, as the days of heaven. But as pertains to each generation, the throne of David would be occupied by descendants only as they walked in the ways of Adonai. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with a rod and their iniquity with the stripes. 
but I will not break off my loving kindness from him nor deal falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by his holiness, by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever, and his throne on the sun before me, as the sun before me. It shall be established forever, like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. So who's the final king of the son of David? Yeshua. And Peter tells us in Acts 2, David looked ahead, saw the resurrection of the Messiah, there was, that there was one who was seated upon his throne. The apostolic scripture portion we have chosen records the fifth and sixth utterance of Yeshua upon the cross. He said, I thirst and it is finished. If we combine the record of all the gospels, we, we discover that Yeshua spoke seven times from the cross. Now, we're going to study this after, in the afternoon study. Any of you would like to come in? at 3.30 at the, in the other room there. We're going to study the seven sayings. And we're going to spend a little time particularly on Psalm 22 because I got waylaid in a very good way. I started studying that again because I had written on it some years ago and uh, found some stones I had not un- turned over and found something very interesting about Psalm 22. Um, some of it you already know, but some of it I didn't even know. And so it's just a reminder of how God preserves his scriptures. But at any rate, we're going to do that in the afternoon. Um, The seven um, sayings, Father, forgive them. The second is, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The third is, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. And the fourth is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth is, I thirst. The sixth, it is finished. And the seventh, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, there are textual variants on some of these, uh, but we accept these as being authentic. As with Israel and David, so the final words of Yeshua before his death carry supreme significance for the generations that would follow. That's why I think it's worthy for us to study them specifically, and we'll do that uh, after lunch at 3.30.